being here, and hello to people in the virtual world. So gratitude has been on my mind a lot, and not just because some of us celebrate Thanksgiving tomorrow or because it's National Gratitude Month, but because I really have embraced it as an intentional practice for my own psychological health, because as we all know, our brain has a negativity bias, and so we kind of grasp onto and remember the negative things that happen. And so having a gratitude practice for me really helps to bolster my mood and lends me perspective. So even something like writing three things that I'm thankful for that happened during the day at night before bed is really helpful for me. And so on the theme of gratitude, what I'd like to do tonight is share 14 poems of gratitude that I've written for 11 individuals. And the appropriate place to start, I thought, was with mother, because that is where we as humans start, or where our human form starts. So this one is called Mother Mary. I want to write a poem about the last time I saw my mother. It would be a modest poem describing an autumn afternoon in Colorado when a mother and daughter sat together on a back patio and the daughter assessed a neglected lawn full of leaves, dry grass, and sticks. This poem would recount how the daughter started breaking the debris into piles, working by quadrant across the wide space, and how she looked over to the patio every few minutes to check in with her quiet mother, who nodded and smiled, leading the daughter to wonder about the mysterious inner landscape of dementia. And how time passed with the crinkling and whooshing of leaves and the rakes scraping the ground, and how the repetitive motion felt to the daughter like a meditation. And how when she was focused intently on the task facing away from the house, she turned slightly and noticed her mother standing nearby, shoulders curved forward, a rake in her hands, slowly gathering up detritus. I want to write a poem about the last time I saw my mother, but it always stops there, because how can I describe the fullness of that moment, the wordless connection, the tenderness, the peace? Thank you. And now we move to my best friend from childhood, Pam Miller. And she and her family were really important to me in multiple ways. There was a little chaos in my home, even though it was a really idyllic environment to grow up in in Melbourne, Colorado. But her home and her love and companionship really saved me. So this poem is from my childhood, well, it was written about 10 years ago, but it's about my childhood, and it's a poem of gratitude for Pam, and then also for the environment that was beautiful, Loveland, Colorado. Favorite memory for Pam. In Colorado, dust lasts forever. Apricot, clementine, fire, luscious, grape, divine, distinct outlines muted, drenched in warm light. In other words, heaven. For hours after supper, we twirl cartwheels on Pam's lawn until we could no longer see, only feel our movements. Then, inevitably, my mom would yell, Marie, Marie, time to come home. And I'd think, but I am home, Mom. Beneath the sky, tippy toes on earth, here I am. There I was. My live body tricking gravity, laughing, being free. I did know then what I know now. Those times were the kernel of life. Thank you. And now we move on from my mom to my childhood best friend to my son. And I'll read two poems for Drew. The first was written about 11 years ago, and he turns 22 next month. This one is called Jewel in His Eye. 
torture him. Dragons, skateboard, mama, the beautiful boy lights up the world, says yes, stepping out onto the porch, tiptoeing to the ledge of life, looking back at mama only once before dropping in for real, the 12-foot wall, vert. Blue eyes smile, fearless dreaming, the jewel in his eye, before he goes, I see it glimmer. My baby boy grows up. And this one was written for Drew uh, about 10 months ago. Testament. I tried to paint you a painting in case you're tired of words. Warm-throated Gregorian chant echoed against the snow as I brushed the canvas with artistic ineptitude, although I am adept at prayer. So as the brush moved concentrically, I prayed my scrappy drubbing smoothed into rhythmic zen-like strokes, and each time the end of a circle merged with its beginning, my prayers for your healing moved closer to realization. I may never show you the painting. It can hardly be called art. But since my prayers infused the canvas, I will save it as a testament to your love. And when your wounds are healed, I'll run my finger along the seams, the points where in my mind I made you whole. And now I'd like to read two poems for my husband, which I'm sure he's really happy about. He's like <laughs> getting all nervous over there. What's she going to read? And we met each other about 35 years ago, but just reconnected six years ago. Oh. So this first poem was written about six years ago, right on the eve of me leaving to find out what was happening. <laughs> it's called Wyoming. I have to see what this is. I have to go to it, explore, wonder, impose myself split open the dust cloud and dry land, bring my rain. I have to touch this untouchable, listen, receive, sit under the big cedar sky and wait, wait to see how the past reemerges in time. And this one was written about a year ago, and it was in the Catamaran Literary Reader. And they're a great magazine. They print a lot of poems about the sea. They're from California. My Gatherer, for Steve. Caught in moon tides at twilight, briny seawater scrubs and sears my lungs. A hypnotic pulse illumines the shore my beacon. You pull me from the noose of shipwreck nets and frock waves, stitch me together, pin roses in my hair, and make me beautiful. Cortisol rivulets dig troughs in my brain from past schisms, making my heart opening drama a glacial tiptoe. Yet you wait, and your patient witness invites repose. In your waters of benevolence, I rest, my loosened fragments bonded by your love. The sea glitters now, and on its salt milk dreams, I float. Now on to one of my good friends, Ellen. She's an activist, and she lives in Bellingham. She's turning 84, I believe, in January. So she's an octogenarian. And I'd like to share two poems. We're here for octogenarians. Yes, so this first one I wrote about two months ago. It's called Indistinguishable for Ellie. For her, God became bigger than doctrine more encompassing than dogma. God became breath and space, 
and emptiness. God became her pulse at rest and the full body surrender of not knowing, of unknowing. God became the nesting of sparrows and finch in the courtyard outside her window and the generous pine boughs bobbing in the autumn breeze. God became free of the boundedness of words. And as God became free, she became free too. At the same rate and into the same wide expanse, she and God grew together, bursting beyond any human conception or limitation. They became air, drafts mingled with light, carrying our prayers everywhere. And then this was inspired by Ellen's spirit. Tiny altars. I happened to be in the grocery store the moment I gave up for good. An elderly woman paused in passing, and as if she could see the mound of broken ribs in my mind, said to me, it's time to shed your stone, Atlas. Her tone and delivery were casual, as if this would be an easy thing for me to do. She continued past me, and I proceeded down the aisle, gripping the cold metal cart. When I rounded the corner, my shoulders weakened, and the weight just rolled off, crumbling into tiny altars at my feet. Mm. Thank you. And now on to one of my professors and friends, Dr. Vincent Harding. He was a mentor of mine and a professor at the Iliff School of Theology in Denver, and he's one of the reasons that I decided to go there. And Dr. Harding was a friend and colleague of Martin Luther King Jr. And this one is called Benediction for Vincent. One time in class, Vincent Harding looked at me, a quiet white girl, and with lilting gravitas, said, Martin belongs to you. Suspended in held breath, those four words trembled with esoteric profundity, the eyes of every student fixed on me, waiting. What does he mean? What will she say? Why her? I, too, was confounded. Why would this prophet of justice give his friend to me? Hadn't white people been taking king for far too long? Didn't belonging presuppose possession, something king himself observed? As time lingered in the classroom, the meaning of Dr. Harding's statement unveiled itself in the silence. Martin belongs to you was a widening of the circle, an affirmation of inclusivity a belief in the capacity of everyone to be the light. Martin belongs to you, was a vocalization of King's beloved community, a hope set in motion decades before, a vision requiring rebirth each new day. Martin belongs to you, was a sharing of the dream for the sake of the ongoing struggle. The more minds in the fight, the better. The more feet on the pavement, the better. Above all, Martin belongs to you was a challenge and a charge. In that classroom, with those words poised in the air, I realized the magnitude of the work still to be done. Martin belongs to you was an invitation to begin. we went and climbed to an overlook, and as we were halfway up, 
this amazing, beautiful dog started running towards us. And my, I mean, I love wolves, so I was like, is that a wolf? You know, <laughs> it's, it's a, like a husky German shepherd type. And we were in the wild, so it made sense. But this <laughs> dog was so beautiful, and it hung out with us, and it really connected with my friend Nan, who was going to be here tonight, but couldn't make it at the last minute. So this is a poem for Nan and the dog, and a poem of gratitude for this space and the beauty of the land. Kawichi Canyon Stray, for Nan. He found us at the line of prismed light under autumn blossom sky. Serpentining through needle grass and sage, he bounded up the rocky talus to find us, to find you. His young spirit exuded openness, invitation. He was an adventurer seeking home. In the arid shrub step, his grounding presence filled empty acres within our hearts, within your heart, also seeking home. Thank you. And so that dog was a stray and now lives with Nan in oh, loving wow. Nan home. Oh, wow. Very beautiful story. Very happy dog and very happy Nan. Very happy everyone else is here. Yeah. <laughs> watching um, it's called the year we worked for the estate of Jimi Hendrix oh. for Melody yeah. a lot happened the year we worked for the estate of Jimi Hendrix like when that stalker broke into your apartment and cut his hair in your kitchen you came home from work to find dark clumps scattered across your floor the next day at the bus stop, he smiled at you, showing off his new short hair. It was 1996, you were so young. My mama bear instinct kicked in and I scooped you up. I wanted you to be safe and healthy and happy. I remember when you called me to tell me you had breast cancer. It was the middle of the pandemic and you were stayed away. I couldn't be with you. I could only pray for you, write songs for you. Then one year later, we met in the wilderness, and I baptized you in the glittering sun. A year after that, we were in the desert, meeting David Gray and dancing in the orange light of dusk. Now you are cancer-free. Now you laugh again. Now your humor is as dry and sharp as ever. Now you see the lake upon waking each morning and watch the seasons unfold across an expansive lawn while the sapphire sky blesses you at dawn.
his thin, tremulous ears flap as if applauding, and how magnificently he sways to this quasi una fantasia that wanes and waxes from dreamy to brisk, fierce, mellifluous beauty composed by the superlative master, 1801. In our best moments, humans possess a tremendous capacity for charity and grace. A grand piano resting on a dewy grass field at midnight. How creative we can be in our desire to comfort and connect. true love carved in stone. Holding his hand, I traced in the wake of his tousled amber hair. He wrote odes among the trees for me. When you believe in reincarnation, anything is possible. Love can be written centuries apart. Hmm. Thank you. That one was one of the winners of the Sue Boynton contest in 2017. And the cool part about that contest up in Bellingham is your, your poem gets to appear on a bus. On the oh, entire yeah, bus. Yeah, yeah. For a year, so. That was neat. And they pair it with an artist. Mm -hmm. I have a, I have a, it's a different, it's actually, when I get up there, they start talking about what I have on my It's not good. Okay. How long is it? Okay. So um, the last poem is a, a poem of gratitude for my own resilience. And I think that's important for us to all recognize is everything that we've been through and that we're still here. So it's a very short poem called Letting Go of Grief. Speaking out was the moment I realized my power. Hiding secrets in a shell magnified an ominous grief diminishing my vision and voice. So I allowed the truth to flow out of me, down the steep hillside I had been climbing, to quench the hot and dusty gulch below me and make a new river from which thirsty birds now drink. Thank you so much for your attention take any questions that you might have. So, uh, what was your, did you get a, did you go to a, you went to Naropa too, right? But did, but did you go to another school like, um, music or something? Yeah, I went to the Island School of Theology, to a seminary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seminary. And then, and then did you go to Naropa afterwards? To I went to Naropa before. Oh, before. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I studied Buddhism and was Buddhist at Naropa and then that was the doorway into Christian mysticism, and so I converted back to My poetry journey uh, it began in high school 
when I was in a class about the romantic poets, so Keats, Shelley, Byron, and Wordsworth. And I was just starting to have symptoms of bipolar disorder. And so I was really depressed and I slept through every class. And then at home, my mom was in and out of the hospital a lot with um, depression. And so it was just really kind of an unstable time. So I slept through most of my classes. And then I heard Ode to Nightingale recited in class by John Keats. And I woke up and I was like, this is exactly where I am right now, actually, <laughs> just in a different century type thing, right? You know, in the garden thinking, is life really worth living? I mean, what is the point? And then, um, you know, he came to the conclusion, I think, and there's multiple interpretations, but you know, that life is worth living. And so I have, throughout my journey, come to that conclusion as well. But so I started writing poetry as the purgative experience, you know, with everything that was going on at home. And then it was really helpful therapeutically like that. And then I started to just read more about it and understood it as a craft and as some, a challenge, you know, something to learn more about and to try to make as good as I could while still having it as a container to express my feelings. So, and now I'm 50, so I've been writing since I was about 16. Talk about your group. Your dream music is a dream of the beginning of the dream. Do they always begin in dreams? Oh, my poems, do they always begin in dreams? Well, there's that one, apparently. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, what I do is every morning I get up and I journal mm -hmm. from like 5 30 to 7 mm -hmm. or longer. And so then, if usually it's like, what happened yesterday, what I dreamt about, a to-do list that I have to do for that day. But then, you know, once I can get that stuff out of the way and really kind of get into what I'm really feeling, there'll be a phrase or even maybe sometimes a word that catches me. And then I just have to remember it for the next time I have time to write. And then occasionally I'll just be so inspired by something that I'll just you know, write something and I'll be revising it for a few days or a few weeks. But nature has been a big muse for me in my life. And music. Marie, the first poem, Mother Mary, was it your mother or blessed mother or perhaps your parents? Yeah. It was my mother. Yeah, my mother Mary. In, with Christian mysticism, is there any reference to Blessed Mother? Perhaps in there, yes. My mom was actually in the convent from ages 18 to 22. And she had been called to be a nun. And so she was a novice training. And then something happened in there that caused her to leave. So she really did want to be a nun. And so a lot of, like, what I, the poem I originally was going to read was really religious for her, but I decided it, um, to read this one instead. So a lot of my poetry about her is, is religious. Thank you. executing the proposal that I put forward. And I've been meeting so many amazing creatives along the way that want to collaborate. And so I'm working with the Ellensburg Arts Commission just saying, you know, these are amazing things, like the, the nature walks. You know, that was kind of a collaboration with Nan Doolittle of a Northwest Expressive Arts response. And I didn't want to pass that up just because I had another set of things to do. And so the Arts Commission has been great about, yes, just go for it. Let's, you know, adapt your plan. 
so that you can participate in and take advantage of these opportunities. But the, one of the goals of the Pope Laureate position is to engage diverse audiences. And so, for example, I did a poetry reading at the Pacifica Senior Living Memory Care Facility. That was really meaningful, especially because my mom died of dementia. So, And then, uh, so we went from the elders there, and then I was at the Ellensburg High School for their creative writing club, where we did blackout erasure poetry, and then George L. Lyons' Where I'm From poetry exercise, which is really a powerful one. So we did that with, with some students, and then the two poetry nature walks, and a few different readings. One was at Old Schools, which is a business in Ellensburg, and that was with John Bedorje and his poetry consortium, Headlight Children, and with Inland Poetry. So those are some examples. And also, yes, that is going to be amazing. So on March 3rd, everyone's invited to Gallery One in Ellensburg to celebrate Women's History Month. And we're going to have Washington State poet Rena Priest as the headliner. And then we are going to do a poem or a crown of sonnets. We're still in the organizing phase. And this is going to be celebrating the historical women of the So, yeah. And then the other thing that's important to me is the healing circle idea, because I really believe in poetry as a healing modality, because that's how it's operated for me. And I also see it as not only kind of that individual healing modality, but as community building and bringing people together, as such something like Lift Peace bring, brings people together. And so one thing I'm going to be starting is uh, poetry healing circles at the Kittitas County Recovery Community Organization. So working with folks in recovery and doing poetry there. So yeah, those are some examples. Do you have favorite poets of your own? Yes, let's see. So John Keats. <laughs> you already knew that. Um, Lee Young Lee has amazing work. Uh, Maya Angelou and um, Claudia Moreau, she, I don't know if she writes all that much, but she wrote some books in Seattle that were really meaningful to me in the, the 1990s. And Mary Oliver's work, just because it's so, you know, nature absorbed, and um, Sonia Sanchez. Yeah, so those are some, and Paul Salon. Uh, yes, so Paul Salon's work. Generation, I guess. I mean, and having gone to Naropa, you'd think I'd be into the beats. Yeah, yeah. Right, I know, and you're kind of disappointed. I'm not sure. 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 I'm not not been necessarily inspired or not maybe thoroughly immersed enough immersed, to be yeah. inspired. I, so I'll, I'll in, do some immersion and I'll get yeah, back to you on that. Yeah. I did read an article about Kerouac a few weeks ago about his extreme Catholicism and how that was kind of a flashpoint with Ginsburg. Right. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of women in the movement. I mean, I knew too, but Not like a scholar, I'm just chiming in. <laughs> well, there's a lot. 
a lot of different discussions. I mean, beat was characters that beat Nick I think was for Kane and some column later, just like journalists kind of want to find a certain amount of time in Sputnik. But again, it was just, well, I mean, it's a complex history, and, but it seems like, well, it's past. It seems like out of past. I think mean, it's good. Well, what I'm hearing from you is that you have chosen, in a sense, chosen, like with that awakening, to say, okay, this is my a way of like, you know, dealing, helping yourself and healing, and you're, you're going to be looking at this particular focus to people. You know what I'm saying? You're not like no. delving like me. Like I, my stuff comes out in the negative. Like it's like very opposite. It's like I deal with my mental whatever, like. Like the darkness, my writing is the darkness oh. comes out. All of my stuff comes out through it, you know. In you know, and you're saying, you know, you are in this space, and you chose your journey. It seems to me is that you're saying, no, I'm going to be doing this as a bomb, as a not a bomb, but you know what I'm saying? No, yes, I, I do know what you're saying, and I think that maybe it's because I chose poems of gratitude for tonight well, yeah, of that course, it looks more right, right. cheerful than it actually is. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. okay. It's not the same thing. Right, but you're welcome to buy some books and then we'll hit the dark side. No, yeah, I think that's what I'm just trying to play off what he's saying. He's saying, where's the anger? Where's oh, the, the anger. Yeah, there's some anger. There's, there's, there's some anger. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to kind of stay away from that for Thanksgiving. Yeah, right. But, um, Oh, this is what makes, I think makes you a wonderful poet laureate because I mean, so many kind of faces around yeah. how to interact with so many different types of mm -hmm. and, and that is really refreshing because I, I know I couldn't be poet laureate. <laughs> I would get kicked out too. <laughs> but, no, I really believe that poetry is for everybody. Yeah, right. right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have this anti-poetry motif that kind of comes out of that. Like all, all of the poetry factories and the workshops and things. Because this is the way we learn. We came from the North and the Street. I will argue. Yeah. yeah. So that's it. But thank you for being you and bringing that to us. Can you tell us a little bit about how the how Christianity and Buddhism have worked its way into some of your work? Mm -hmm. Some of the poems, especially in my first book, Pink Sunset Luminaries, there's a whole section on, on spirit. And so some poems are specifically about God. And <coughs> then in terms of Buddhism, it's more not writing about Buddhism, but maybe poems, some poems coming from more of a meditative state, yeah. that type. Well, <laughs> 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 the, the Buddhism comes through. I mean, the, the, the compassion comes through. You know, the, the, the attached to the form of the Buddhism, you can feel you have a Buddha nature without without all the trappings of talking about seeing. Do we have any other questions? Well, maybe, maybe time for one more question before people take a little bit of a break. Yeah, the most inspiration, maybe for some beginner poets, would you say that times of struggle, times of transition, mundane, all the above, where do you find that emotional um, context to jumpstart into some writing? So for some inspiration for jump starting, I, I think that poetry, for me anyway, requires three things. One is, is quietude, one is time, and the other is attention. So to, and actually a fourth would be intention. So to, you know, make some time to be in a quiet space to have the intention to put something down on paper to start to work with. And then understanding that the initial experience 
is it evolves. It's different than kind of the revision experience that may happen later on. So that actually can kind of free your mind, knowing that what I write in the next hour isn't going to be kind of the final poem that I can write the next lit piece. You know, you can go through different phases of revision and thereby use different parts of your brain, which is kind of cool. So just trying to make sure, and then to be really, um, just to focus on some concrete things in nature can be really helpful for that because there's so many metaphors in nature and that connect to our lives. So if you can see your life and things happening in your mind in nature and then kind of capture that and write that down. A few years ago for National Poetry Month, I made a three minute video called Why I Write Poetry and I asked some of my poet friends to just say for a few you know, seconds why they write poetry and one gentleman, Nick Kendall, said, poetry is complete freedom. And I love that because it's so true and I totally feel that. And so if you can go into your poetry time and say, I can be completely free for the next hour. And then we'll see what, what happens, what comes out. I just, you know, you said quietude, time, ascension, and intention, and I realized that, like, the meditative project is kind of that, too, and it's like, turning anything into a meditation mm -hmm. is that to some degree, and it's like where we put our love, where we put our attention and intention is where we make progress, and I'm wondering if there are times when you have had to be like, I don't really know what's going to happen today, or maybe this is where you live, and you do right, like, that, that there's like, I just got to go in, I got to do quietude, Right, that can be a struggle, and then kind of that struggle can maybe result in this resi inner resistance to writing, you know, and then get frustrated because it's not being produced. But I just, I don't know, I guess I've lived long enough to know that they're, I just call them the writing tides, and so sometimes my spirit is loquacious, and then sometimes I'm just busy doing other kind of stuff in life, and you know, giving birth and you know, buying groceries and things like that. And then, <laughs> like, then hopefully I'll have time to write poetry later. But it's a balance, balancing life, poetry, everything. But thank you for this wonderful time together. I really appreciate your attention. <laughs>